Hello and welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for September. Why is it sunny in September? It's been a bit rainy in September. It's meant to be getting colder. It's meant to be putting jumpers on. It's certainly getting a bit darker. But don't you worry, because I ain't going to say sorry. Because when it comes to videos, I know a man. Or a duck. (laughs) Or a duck. He's interrupting already. He could be Kagan or he could be Kagan. (laughs) Don't worry. It's Ori. Hello, Ori. Hello. (laughs) Ori Kagan. From Kagan Productions. Oh, my goodness. You've got the duck in the middle of productions. So it's actually... Oh, you only got it now? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) What? I did. I I I don't do any research. There's no research happening here. I tested this logo so many times because I was so worried people will just not get the joke. And that's a funny thing. Every time I showed it to a Hebrew speaker in in Israel, they would say, Mm -hmm. "What's Kagan portions? I I don't. I don't get it." (laughs) And everyone else, they immediately saw productions. Yeah. And only a certain uh, amount of people like got the joke and laughed at it but you know i'm a dad i allow myself uh, dad jokes that felt fitting i mean it looks like a chicken <laughs> you're the first I'm to say just that gonna say it looks like a chicken it it's just it yellow. reminds me of the chicken <laughs> out of the wrong trousers so i look at it so i've got kagan pro chicken shins that's not even a thing that's not even close to something are you going to change it i mean i think there's a logo kind of rework at least you could have a little sign underneath the duck to say this is a duck well funny you should mention it i've actually you know i feel like everyone who just loves games eventually Mm -hmm. builds a game in his brain and he wants to design it and that sort of happened to me and eventually i partnered with another designer and we created a game called scrappy ducks i haven't really (laughs) talked about it yet uh, because it's very early in playtesting. He's right. He's right in there with kind of like the promotion. It's a it's a duck <laughs> building game. <laughs> no, you're not allowed that. How, how on many, the other side of it, on the other, on the other side, I'm not. You know, it's like I could I can press stop recording at any time. Just kick you out. <laughs> I can I'm just not promoting anything. It's just yeah. something I'm working it's like on. Five because... minutes. It's just something I happen to be working on. Oops, look at me tripping over this Firefly box. Also <laughs> something I happened to be working on. See, you went on a show with Ben Maddox from Five Dames for Goom- Five Dames for Goom's Day. In, in <laughs> that's not even that's the Dooms five, of, of Apocalypse five dames, games. Five Dames for Goom's Day is a completely different show. Which is literally it's like when RuPaul takes over five days <laughs> five games for Doomsday <laughs> instead. It's a full drag thing. What five dresses and makeup sets would you take with you if the apocalypse was going to come? It's five dames for Goomsday. That's that's coming to coming to Apple Podcasts (laughs) kind of soon. Coming to Apple Podcasts soon. You're in the industry full time. Mm, Yeah, yeah. Is it is it predominantly? Just tabletop stuff that you're doing. Are you do? Are you, are you one of these people that you kind of, yeah, we you're kind of doing kind of like the tabletop videos, and you've done some like I mean, you know, we're, we were joking earlier on in the green room about kind of like name dropping and stuff like that. But you, I mean, we're like going. It's like watching like a films, films, best films and video games I've ever heard. You I mean you've got like Gale Force Nine and Firefly, Modiphius and Elder Scrolls, Stone Saga from U Games. You've got Star Realms, which is one of my favorite games, oh. which I don't play it again, but we can talk about that as well. And then you've got Dune, again, Modiphius kind of entertainment. But is there also a, is there also a part of you where you've got your kind of like, and in, in the event of a fire, you should be going to this exit, this exit, and this exit, or here's how to apply cream to your donut or you know are you looking for socks we've got you covered kind of thing do you have these kind of corporate kind of videos that you get involved in as well oh wow so this is the story i keep telling that 
I started out only doing these types of videos, you know, a lot of corporations, universities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, explainer videos, those, I don't know if you've heard of those, but some like high tech companies, they would pour tons of money on an event video, which they would only show internally once. So you might be working for months on this mm -hmm. amazing video only to be viewed by people who don't even care. And that's it. It's over. I get a nice paycheck in the end, but it was, yeah. it was, it was very frustrating that a lot of my creativity had to be fueled that way. So did, did you find then with videos like that, where there was only like, it was only going to get shown up once that you sometimes sneaked it kind of like into, into family kind of gatherings. It's like, let's put the video on of my, the, the birth of my first child. And then, Oh no, look, <laughs> Here's, here's an ex explanation on how to use the fire escape in the event of a fire that was made for the local this local business here. Uh, how did that get there? Uh, well, the, the nature of the things I try to throw in there were a bit more lazier, let me say, of right. me really trying to cheat so it looks good enough for them right. to approve, <laughs> even though like someone's hand might be sticking out from their back because there's a lot of animation involved as well. Mm -hmm. um yeah they usually didn't care but you know then COVID hit and compared to many people around me mm -hmm. who were losing their jobs and it was it was really truly terrible i just kept getting more and more work because all of these corporations now wanted to do their fancy oh we're keeping our campuses safe from COVID, yeah. and you know all these explainer videos with their in with their institution at the forefront but at the same time, I've been doing these board game videos for fun, for Kickstarters. I just, I needed something for my soul. That seemed the ultimate way to do it. Kickstarters always need videos. Yeah, I love Kickstarters. I love board games. I, I'm part of the community. I just asked around, did a video or two, and word of mouth did its magic. And just everything sort of hit at once during COVID where I was getting multiple requests for board game videos and multiple requests for corporate industry videos. And I realized I'm going to have to make a choice. And I, I, I mean, I really remember that day sweating and holding my, my phone and just yeah. going through all my corporate contacts and essentially firing them, <laughs> just telling them, wow. don't send me any more work. Cause yeah. I, I, I had a hard time saying no for anything. Everything I was that point in my life was beginning, you know, everything that came my way, I would say yes, you know, no problem. And then I just fully committed to just board game videos to see what, what would happen. Um, mm -hmm. It was a risk, but it paid off. I mean, Skyrim was right after the, right after that. It was like, you know, it was sort of the sign. It's like the, uh, the, the dragonborn sign that I chose the right path. <laughs> That must have been... I mean, what we do at this point in the movie is we pause. Mm. You stare off into the distance. And then we rewind back to kind of like the first time you remember a film. Because I think as a child, any you know, it's easy for kids to kind of get hold of like a, pa a pad of paper, some colouring pencils or paint. <laughs> put something together. So how old were you when you kind of like, I mean, was getting into the film design stuff? Because the stuff that you do seems to be quite graphical led as opposed to being you sitting behind a camera and kind of directing a scene and telling people where to kind of go. But I'm guessing there must have been the film, the actual love of film creation must have come at a fairly kind of, youngest age so when did that when did that kind of happen what was your journey with that i actually remember that day very very well okay because we were just coming back from school and my dad we had we didn't have a like a tv room in my house yeah. we had those big square cubic tvs on sort of like cabinet on wheels that would squeak along and we would just move it from room to room you know yeah 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 than the way we do today with the uh, iPads. But uh, so basically our dad uh, squeak, squeak and <laughs> took the trolley, squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. And he said, there's a movie I want you to watch. And it was Star Wars. 
And I looked at it and I'm like, dad, I don't think I like this. And the reason <laughs> I said this was because it looked like Star Trek to me. And I oh. previously watched Star Trek and it was too scary. But ah. he said, don't worry, don't worry, just trust me. Hmm. And he put it in and you know, the fanfare started and then the crawl. And the first thing my dad said was, what? I thought this was the first one. This is, this is episode four. Oh, well, just watch this one anyways. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was a da- it's a dad joke that works if you actually know what the real so joke is. I, actually, I need to call him up and ask him if that... He probably won't remember. I don't know if that was a joke or not because I, was, I remember starting the movie angry. Also because I told him, I don't want to watch this. And also yeah. because, Dad, you, you screwed it up. You gave us the wrong movie. And I just remember being completely in this sort of transcendent experience of, oh my God, this is like a world I want to be in all the time. And I remember after watching the movie, I was like talking with my brother and all the way to school, we talked about Star Wars. On the way back, we talked about Star Wars and, you know, I wanted to get watch the next one. Mm. And then I had the original, like, you know, I'm your father twist, which was like, oh, it blew my mind. And that completely transformed my life because then I realized I could have so much passion for another world, for another sort of reality. And that sort of bled to all these other fandoms, Indiana Jones, of course, Back to the Future, Dune, which was a huge thing for me, which started from a book. But I had that sort of muscle of I call it the daydreaming muscle. I just lived in those worlds all the time. I used to Mm -hmm. imagine all these things. And eventually, you know, I said, I I remember there was the website, theforce.net, and they started putting up those fan films, which are legendary. And I realized, I want to make my own fan film. So, (laughs) So we got our plastic lightsabers, me and my friends. We choreographed a whole, like, crazy fight scene and I invite, and you know, nobody had cameras then. Camera was a w- rare thing. I had to get one of my dad's friends to come over with his camera. Uh-huh. And then I realized, okay, I need to start thinking about it. So I said, we should probably do this three times. Shoot from left, right, and center. And then we install, oh, he did it. We, we, we did the whole filming thing. And then I installed an editing software, which was Adobe Premiere. You know, obviously it was pirated back then. Didn't have any money for these things. <laughs> and I tell myself also editing. And if you're listening, Adobe. Yes. No, I'm yeah. paying you now. Pirate is fine. Now, pirate, no, pirate is fine. <laughs> pirate is fine. Adobe, after your recent regulations of the rules that you've come out with, right? Anybody. I'm not saying Ori should actually. Do you know what? I'm going to stop that and say, what was the name of your character? Because if it wasn't, if it wasn't or, Ori One Kenobi, Oh, we need to have words. Well, that wasn't my character, but that was my email address. My email address was already (laughs) at yahoo.com does not exist anymore. Yahoo scraped it. But yeah, Ori1 is something that that remained for a very, very long time. I think some of my in-game names are Ori1. But yeah, I, we did make like most of that movie and I learned how to do saber effects and it got lost to time somewhere on an old computer. I only have very, very few renders of, of us, like with actual lightsaber effect. And then when it, like a little bit before I was in, in the army and I realized I need to decide what I want to do with my life. Yeah. All of a sudden I realized that is an actual job making mm-hmm. movies. And it, I sort of didn't consider it until that point. It was just like, I could actually do this for a living. And that's, that, that was basically where everything connected. What 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 are the opportunities for where where you are just now in terms of kind of exposure and kind of promotion yourself and stuff like that? Because I'm guessing I'm guessing they're not that great because you're speaking to a Scottish guy at like half past nine. <laughs> no, no, but in all seriousness, because you're you know you're you're in you're based in Israel, you're born and bred in Israel, and I'm guessing that there's not a huge Star Wars kind of movie making kind of industry there or am I or am I wrong no you're absolutely right it's true on on both things one 
the geek culture here was not very good. I was, I was a lot really like bullied for, for liking the things I liked for playing D and D yeah. and, and liking star Wars and stuff like that. And when it comes to filmmaking, I did go to Tel Aviv university to study film and TV. Mm-hmm. And this is another story I told, but I think, I think it really fits to answer your question. I was very excited to become a director. I wanted to be the creator of the movie because that's, that was where I enjoyed it. I enjoyed not being yeah. a cog in the machine. I enjoyed telling the story. And I won't forget this day where they took us on a, a road trip to the studios in Israel. And we went there. We got there very early, like 6.30 in the morning. A lot of the people and crew that come there, they get there an hour and a half earlier than that. And I just remember... Yeah walking through all these gigantic sets filled with people, black circle under their eyes, holding their coffee cups, their souls drained. And their (laughs) eyes were just telling me, you know, get out, run, don't do this. (laughs) And furthermore, I had uh, a few mentors that were like famous directors that I studied with and in Israel which, you know, compared to Hollywood is, is not a lot. They would have to teach to make a salary. Just to yeah, 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 yeah. But I would yeah. ask them, you know, how, how did he make it? What was your big break? And the story was always the same. It's always, well, I happened to be during a day where someone else was sick and I just happened to have a skill someone was looking for and they gave me a chance. It was like a one in a million and they liked what I did. So they gave me another thing. And yeah. they like what I did, so they gave me a movie. Hmm. Yeah, and I would I would listen to that. I was just like, that is Im- that is impossible. I I don't want to throw my life into the fates like that. I want to have more control. I want to have more agency. There is just no way where I just go into the system where I'm a cog in a machine which has no interest in, in giving me more agency because they just want me to, I don't know, hold a boomstick or, you know, dress a set or just hold a coffee mug or something like that, because that's what happens. A lot of the people I studied with are still doing these, these jobs and just from, from production to production. So that's why I became eventually an editor. An editor oh, was right. okay. where I felt like I had the most control because mm. I'm taking a lot of footage and I'm stitching it together and I'm telling a story, even though it's not my story, it's someone else's and sometimes it was corporate. And I started working at a marketing agency, (laughs) just (laughs) making marketing videos. And it was literally the same marketing video over and over and over. Just a person with a green screen talking about skincare, talking (laughs) about, you know, all these weird small businesses. And it was all about quantity, 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 work faster, faster, faster. And you can probably guess that I would do that. I would always find ways to express myself. And, you know, one, 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 one day we had what's called a sleep instructor. It's someone that teaches parents how to put their kids to sleep. <laughs> in a way it's, yeah no no I've, yeah no i mean i've yeah I, yeah i've been you know been there done that yeah, one, the, yeah. one of the t-shirts i know exactly what, yeah yeah normally it's kind of like shut the door and running away but I'm interested <laughs> yeah earmuffs but i felt like her video really needed some personal touch so i added some characters and birds and animations and stuff like that and it completely blew the minds of of my superiors and they said that's amazing could you make five of those a day <laughs> oh, you crazy okay jump forward two years after taking that it was just it was becoming very toxic i had my firstborn there and they were just like you know gotta come in on time you cannot leave you need to stay after work after hours you know come on fridays as well which is supposed to be a free day and eventually when i said you know i need to leave because my my kid was sick and my wife was uh, eight months pregnant or yeah. nine months i think it was they said, what's going to be your next excuse? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. And, you know, that's <laughs> that's when I let out my Hulk, my inner Hulk, which I didn't even know existed. I mean, it, I think it was the angriest <laughs> I've ever been in my life. 
Do you, did you say? Did you do this? Did you go like this? Edit this out. Oh, <laughs> it was it was worse. It was wow, worse okay. because it was on a phone call. Wow. Okay. In the middle of the office, and wow. me basically screaming at them, "How dare you!" It's like yeah. it was it was awful. It was awful, and I said I quit immediately. Hmm. And the funny thing is, they didn't think I meant it because I was such an important cog in 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 the whole place. <clears throat> But, you know, that was just so satisfying and, and I'm in a way thankful for them because that really propelled me to, to being, being a freelancer, being independent and, and choosing my own path. Come on, uh, like uh, two months after I left that, that, that job, I doubled my income just by freelancing. It, how, I mean, how often do you get reminded that you could have left that job kind of so much earlier? And kind of being early, earning kind of more money. I mean, it's, I think you've got there's life lessons that everybody kind of learns, and you kind of, I think the kind of the day to day fear of doing something stops an awful lot of people from doing that. Which is why you get like these toxic work environments where somebody turns around and literally goes, "Right, I'll see you later." They're like, they're so used to like having this toxic work environment and and expecting people to just put up with more more rubbish after you know, being piled on one bit after another, that when somebody turns around and says, I've actually, I've had enough of this, it comes as a shock because they are so, they're so, they're so desensitized to it that they don't, they don't recognize that they've, they've inherited such a toxic trait themselves. So that they kind of can't move away. There's two things I want to say about that. One, the crazy thing is my boss at the time was someone I considered my friend. We went to movies, oh, right. okay. we geeked out, we both had a firstborn, and that, that was, it just, everything broke in my brain where I saw someone who got power, mm-hmm. and that power literally went up into his head. And mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. I honestly believe people want to be good and do the right thing, but it was my first sort of, like, real-life lesson of seeing how power can corrupt someone. And that is a lesson I take to me to this day. Because once I started my board game business and never, and you know, this brings us to Skyrim, actually, when I got the Skyrim gig, I was like, I don't think I have the skill levels to make it look as good as I wanted to. And I've been following this other animator in Israel. His name is Daniel Yosef Abdu. And he created a really cool project for his film school where a camera is flying over the settlers of Catan. And all of a sudden, it grows and it becomes a full world of Settlers of Catan. Yeah. It becomes real life. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is someone I want on my team. And I've been contacting him and he's like, yeah, that sounds amazing. But look, I'm, I'm, I'm already going to be employed. I'm, I'm just finishing school. Yeah. And I have this studio that's going to be employing me. I'm like, okay, that's fantastic. But if you notice that something is wrong there, I'm here for you. It took two months for him to be completely broken by that system. They were so demanding. They were just wringing him dry of every bit of creativity. And I could, I could see myself reflected through that. And I I would tell him, Daniel, come on, you gotta leave that there. Can't you see what they're doing to you? I promise I have, I have so much work to give you. I'm not going to force you out, but don't do what's best for you. And I, re- I, I honestly, I felt like I needed to save him in a way so he doesn't have to go for two years suffering this. And he can basically skip all of that tar pain. And he did. He quit. And- See, I heard, I heard it differently, Ori. What I heard was at the same time as Daniel started, there's this mysterious other gentleman started with what p- potentially could be a silly, a kind of a bigger kind of beard. He was about your height, and he basically made Daniel's kind of life hell at that job to the point where I don't think Daniel had a choice. And you on the other side were going, yeah, yeah, just come and work for me. That's what I heard. I heard you kind of, you know, you kind of, you kind of did your kind of like your, it didn't help that I believe that you called yourself Ori One. Again, <laughs> when you were working for join, that company, join well, the so. duck. Join the duck, Daniel. <laughs> join the duck. Join uh, the chicken. <laughs> keep calling the chicken. He's a I'm going to keep calling that chicken forever until you wake up and you and you accidentally 
See, look at our logo. As you can see, we're called <laughs> Kagan Projection Projectinsons. That's turkey. Just turkey accidentally, turkey. like when you're pitching to like your potentially like your biggest win Pokemon, <laughs> contact you. <laughs> see, we want to do a couple of marketing videos for us, sorry. And you're like, sure, I'm ready. Kick up for chicken chins. That's going to stick. You're not going to be able to walk away from it. So did Daniel start with you as a, like a full-time employee? So it was never a full-time employee because right. I never felt safe enough to give him enough work to guarantee a salary. Yeah. I knew I knew it's going to backfire. Mm. And honestly, I told him, you know, you should be free to do what you want. And this is something which I've started to do with all my team members. It's not just putting them in a hole and then, you know, just do the same thing over and over again. I've seen what that does to people's spirit. I want people to grow together with me. So I hope Daniel's okay for with me talking about it because it's, it's a very interesting journey. He basically dedicated himself to working with me for, I think, over three years. Uh -huh. Every single project, we built the environment, he did the animation, and yeah. he was learning, we were learning skills together. We learned Unreal Engine together. We did a few videos on those. And basically every single video that we did was with, with he, he, he was part of the team. And I was, I was all the time telling him, keep in mind, you need to learn. I would explain to them how sales calls works. I will explain to them how I run my business. I'll show, mm -hmm. I'll show mm -hmm. like my, my cash flow and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I want him to just avoid these mistakes of stuff that, you know, me not looking at cash flow suddenly I'm in the, in the minus that happened yeah. to yeah. me once. And it was one of the scariest times of my life when we were like, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to support my family. So I made sure to teach him not to do these mistakes. And, you know, and now it's, Geez, I don't know, five years, two years, five, I, I, five, four or five years. And finally, he, he, he just recently got married. So Mazel Tov. Mm. Okay. And he is finally opening up to his own way. He's been on his free time modeling like TV shows, sets from TV shows of his childhood and, mm -hmm. and all of these crazy animation. I think his, his Instagram is animation wizard. And he finally got an offer for from one of the directors of his childhood TV shows That's who amazing. wanted to do so. And it was just, it's his Skyrim. And I was out, <clears throat> you know, compared to other people, which might be, you know, upset. What, you're abandoning me? No. no. I was super excited for him. I was like, yes, yes, go follow your dreams. I know I'll manage. I'll always find, and he's still working for me. He's not, he's not going anywhere. Yeah, We're yeah, actually yeah. working on yeah. something pretty crazy right yeah. now. And, and. I honestly, if we don't do that, it just people get dragged down and they they lose they lose their passion and they especially with this industry where everything's passion fueled, both with the videos and with board games. You cannot create a corporate board game. I mean, you can, but that you can definitely feel that compared to I don't know video games and movies where there's so much garbage released all the time. I work with so many amazing creators who, who've been working on their board games for years sometimes, never getting tired. I mean, sometimes, but always that, that spark, that, that wanting to take it, to put a piece of themselves into it, right? That's, it's, it's like giving something to the world, having a story that is worth telling. And I, I honestly, that's, if that is what I do my entire life, I'm happy with that. I think, you know, the, <clears throat> the passion thing is really important because, and it's interesting because I was having this discussion with my, my son who's recently gone to university to study law. And I said to him, because we had a, you had a frank, you have, a, have to have the kind of that you're about to go on, you're good at study, you're going to, it's going to, there's going to be money involved and, there's going to be an awful lot of hard work. And it's like, is this something that you're passionate about? Because there is going to, there is going to be some point where, and I said to him, you're going to have six essays to do. They're due in three weeks. Something's happened, which meant you're, you're out for like four days. And then you've got to literally kind of cram everything together. You've got to keep going. You'll have setbacks and stuff like that. 
you've got to have potentially an underlying passion that will keep you going. And I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think in terms, I don't think money is something that provides passion. I think money puts food on the table. I don't know anybody that goes, anybody that goes, well, my passion, my passion is money. It's like, well, that's not going to last you that. It's going to last you so far. But then <clears throat> you can get to the point where you can be earning a lot of money and not being enjoying what you're doing because you don't have the kind of the underlying passion for it. And that's what kind of gets you kind of over the line. It kind of gets you taking, not settling for four ideas, but maybe pushing out and seeing if you've got six ideas instead, just to see if you can twist it kind of around. It's the thing that makes you maybe run a scene again with slightly different lighting just to see if it looks kind of differently. It's the kind of thing that does everything from changing a sound effect to you know, kind of maybe reworking that bit because you're 99% of the way there, but the extra 1%, just no matter how you tweak it, it does just seem to be coming. And I think that's really, I think that's really, really important. And I think you're right when you, when you have somebody that reaches the kind of, not the end of the tether, but if they're on like a lead and you're reaching them out like a kite string, and you see them flying away and they're soaring and they're doing really, really well. And at some point you realize that what's holding that person from really soaring any further is the fact that you've got your hand on the other side of the string. You've got to kind of let it go so they can... Now, they're either going to float off, they maybe hit a tree, you know, they might kind of continue off until the sunset, but wherever off, you've got to kind of let them go on and kind of discover the kind of their own mistakes. In terms of the ideas, because... I'm guessing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing when you, you're, you've got a portfolio in front of you, so I guess when you're pitching to for new business, you say, okay, here's our showreel. This is kind of what we can do. And you've, I've, I've had a, I did have a look at your showreel, and uh, I've got pointers, not many, but just a couple. You know, there's not enough chickens in it, for starters. <laughs> Maybe too many wizards well, there are as well. Chickens to in it. Probably, and there's not, <laughs> you know. I'm going to give you notes after the show just so you can kind of sort it out. But when you're pitching to people, to companies, do you have like a, do you have, do you go and say, right, we're going to do this, 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 and this? Or are you again aware that you could go in with an idea and somebody could say, yeah, the way you did Skyrim, yeah, it was amazing, but there's, that wouldn't work for a product. So how do you approach it, approach a pitch? Do you base it on the company, the work that they do? videos that they've done in the past, you know, how do you kind of approach a pitch for a new company? So the, this is the question of, of my journey until now. And it's so funny because I talk to similar service providers as my own, and we're all tackling this question because we all do what we do because we love it. Okay? Yeah. We all want to be creators. We want to be, we want to insert our vision and we don't want, want revisions. <laughs> that is something we all, we all absolutely hate. Even though sometimes, I, I many, many times in this industry, revisions from the client made the video better. But this is, was my journey. I started out doing exactly what you mentioned. Yeah. I gave a company and then in the sales call, I already am throwing out all these ideas. Oh, we can do this, we can do that, we can do this. You know, sometimes it worked and they go, oh, that's awesome. Let's do that. And sometimes they would be like, oh, maybe, I don't know. And eventually I wouldn't get the sale. And sometimes I would have all these crazy ideas and I would make an amazing video. The client loved it, but then the campaign would tank. I've worked on, on, on some campaigns that just pfft, first day nobody's there and it's just like i'm like but it's such a great game it's such a good video why aren't they and i realized that if i am providing a service here mm -hmm. i'm a service provider and i'm i'm here to help solve a problem if i'm not thinking about that problem i'm not doing my job properly I'm not here just to make a pretty video. This is not going to festivals. This is supposed to be a marketing video. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a reality check for me. And I realized I should be studying this, not just how to do better lighting on Blender or how to use a new piece of software. And I started diving in really, really deep into marketing, into brand strategy, into storytelling tactics. 
and to really figure out how people use this medium of, of cinema, of, of film, of moving pictures in order to essentially sell products. It sounds mm -hmm. cold and corporate, but when you think about it, how do you bring the person that needs or could gain a lot of pleasure or transformation from that specific product, how could you bring them to buying it in a way? How can you elicit an emotional experience that will get them to say, I need this in my life. I want this and I need this and I'm happy to own it. And ever since I started thinking about it this way, I also started challenging my clients about these types of questions. I'm like, well, what is special about your game? Who is it actually for? And I started doing a whole process even before we start talking about the video. They would start in the sales call, they would ask me, okay, so what do you think about this video? And I would say, I, would, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know who the game is for yet. I don't know anything about the game yet. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna discover that. Ever since I started that process, a few things happened. One, which I'm very proud of, there is 100% success on all the campaigns that used my workshop and the insights from it to run their campaign. The second thing that happened is I rarely get any revisions or pushbacks because we start out on an even playing field. We're talking about the product. We're talking about the game. We're figuring out what is special about it. What was that thing that inspired them to even to create it in the first place? And what is it ultimately set out to do? And then from there, since I know and they know what the strategy is, the rest of the video just flows very, very easily. And do you, yeah. do you think there's an issue? Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask a question. I'm going to make a statement and I'm going to see Go if ahead. you agree. Because I think there's an issue nowadays with board games trying to be everything to everyone. And with there being so many games about, sometimes a board game a board game designer will make the mistake in creating a game <clears throat> that plays very, very well at three players. It's excellent at three players. If you sit down with three players... Somebody's going to get an hour and a half of absolute joy out of their life. They're going to have fun. They're going to have their brains kind of challenged and stuff like that. They're going to have a really, really good time. Four players, it becomes a bit busy. At one and two players, it doesn't kind of work because it, it just kind of doesn't work. And what I see more and more is I see squeezing in things like solo campaigns and two players, but you've got to have a bot where they should actually just say, look, if you want a perfect kind of three player game and i see i, I see it i actually see it because i i kind of i kind of do first impressions or write up reviews i do kind of like thought pieces and stuff like that but there there does seem to be i don't know if it's i don't know if it's sometimes if it's to do with like kickstarter i'm not going to say kickstarter but crowdfunding fatigue where somebody puts a campaign on and they say well we've got to we've got to be funded but we've got to cater for every single person that is ever going to play this game when actually what you should be doing is saying, this is the best three player game you're ever going to play in your life. If you want hidden movement, this is the best game. If you want to play one or two players, then if you want one player, go and play Halls of Hegra because that's an amazing one player game. If you want two player game, you know, go and play. Because I played, here's a good example. I played a game called Joyride recently. It's by Rebellion Games. It's basically like a stock race game. You kind of rush, you, you, you run around a track, you drive around a track, you crash into each other, you can use missiles and different things. It's kind of like Demolition Derby on the PlayStation from kind of like years and years yeah. ago. If I'm kind of aging myself by saying that, but I don't <laughs> care, I'm old. But it works really, really well. The, it works really well at three players. It works really, really well at four players. I'm not sure where it works at, at two players. I don't th I don't think there's enough competition. And I think it would just be two people kind of chasing their way around the track. And I think it works well at three and four players and because it's designed for four players. It's four cars. You should literally just say three or four players. Play this game at three or four players. I don't think it, does, it needs a kind of a two-player game or a, a solo-player game. And I'm wondering if that is... 
do you do is that the kind of the approach you take in the video i'm trying to present the game in the best light but it's different to present a game in the best light and actually present it in the right light if you know what i mean absolutely you basically just described my super fan methodology this is exactly what it's about mm. and that that's it really comes from that fear of of wanting to cast the widest net uh, what's called trying to make a game for everyone. And if it's for everyone, then it's for no one. That's, yeah. that's the marketing 101 aspect of it. Um, it's like, I always love to tell this uh, uh, sort of uh, um, this concept of the, the Red Sea and the Blue Sea, right? You got the Red Sea, which has a lot of fish, but also a lot of sharks, and everybody's trying to fish there at once. Yeah. So you try to jump in the red sea is huge okay and you, you can try to dive in but you're gonna have to fight to get every single fish and it's bloody and it's crazy and it's insane or you can go to the blue sea the blue sea is much smaller there might be less fish but you will be the only one there like you said this is the best game for three players i don't think i've ever seen something that is you know categorizes the best game for three players yeah and what happens in the blue sea well you get all the fish because you're the only one there this yeah. is what botany did to people who love flowers and victorian era time aesthetics you know wives of board gamers it was called like the ultimate uh, board game for wives but you know men played it too and that that was just an explosion because nobody has done a game like that and I think every board game should be striving to figure out who exactly is it for. And a few things happens happen when you do this. One, you're not spending so much time and effort on, on wasted potential of, of, of just cold leads. You're yeah. going for the lowest hanging fruit for the people that this game was literally made for them. You literally, the only challenge that you have is to getting them to know about it and to pay attention for a few more seconds. You know, that's where a video can really, really help. And once they know about the game and they recognize themselves as potential super fans, they would pay anything for that experience. So your challenge is just finding who the super fan is, where do they hang out, and what will catch their eye. Nowadays, <clears throat> we've got, there's multiple kind of crowdfunding platforms. So, which is why I don't use, I, I prefer to use the term, I used to use the term kickstart. Mm -hmm. And now I use the word term crowdfunding because first of all, I've kind of fallen a little bit out of love with kind of kickstart, to be perfectly honest. It, 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 it kind of seems more and more to be like a, how to put it? It's like a, it's like a spot, it's like a Spotify of this world kind of thing. It, it's providing a platform, but it's not doing anything more than providing kind of like a platform. I mean, Spotify is trying to change it because they're bringing in like kind of podcast hosting and stuff like that. They're kind of, they seem to be, and there's also I think legal things kind of going on with Spotify about how much it plays it. But Kickstarter seems to be like kind of give us give us your game put it on there and that's fine and if anything happens you know if anything happens to the backers ah well if anything happens to the game ah well it's kind of one of these things and it's kind of brought in so you've now got things like backer kit and you've kind of got game found as well as kind of kickstar for somebody who's making kind of videos are you just like going yes <laughs> oh. I've now got I've got so many more kind of kind of places, and as somebody who is obviously, I take it you don't you know you don't create a video and then sit back and say thanks for your money, bye. I'm taking your kind of monitoring the campaign because it you'll be able to see how kind of well it does. Are I'm you kind of are you looking at kind of like the different platforms mm -hmm. now and saying if somebody's on kind of like say Game Found. This is the kind of game that should be on GameFound, but if it's Kickstarter, it should be kind of like a uh, game. I'm sorry, Kickstarter at the moment seems to be uh, naked women and STL files because <laughs> that's, that's all it seems to be. I was like searching for board games, and it's like you know, here's our Ursula pinup. It's like I don't, I don't. Here, here's the nude version. It's like what? What are you five? It's like. You know, <laughs> 
He was like, "Here, we made this in five minutes in Blender." Yes, I can tell. I can tell you did. I can tell you did. But going back to the question, are you noticing kind of like a change? Is it has is it going to change how you approach videos, or are you are you going to have like, well, this style works better for the Kickstarter audience. This style works better for the backer kit audience. This style is going to work for the kind of the game found audience. Have you seen that kind of yet at all? So when it comes to the video itself, I don't think there's a, a very big difference because we're still focused on the product. I mean, yeah. every single of my videos is, is I try to make it as different as possible, not forcefully, but I'm trying to make the best video for the game, mm. not the best video for the video's sake, which is why if, if you've noticed, you know, that we've had, we did Skyrim, we did Rome Total War, which, you know, did warrant a sort of AAA character animation treatment and stuff like that. Yeah. But we don't really do that mostly. We really want to focus on showing the game and what, you know, what's the experience. We're not teaching the rules, but we're showing, we want, I want people that by the time they finished watching the video, they play the video, they want to play the game. That is the goal. They don't need to understand how it's played. They just want to, to experience some of what they've seen inside. And sometimes yeah. we know we bring you into the world. We bring you, we show like a specific mechanic. We show a cool component. We show shiny miniatures whatever it takes for that specific game when it comes to deciding on the platform i guess that goes back to the super fan method you need to figure out where your potential fans are going to hang out Mm -hmm. because if it's going to be a huge massive dungeon crawling game with tons of miniatures then yes absolutely you should be on game found that's where the gamers are hanging out that's a platform literally dedicated just to those big heavy board games um most of them there are some lighter ones, but those actually do better on Kickstarter. Kickstarter is better for the smaller games um, because you might get people that have never played a board game before that somehow get to your Kickstarter page. You might get people who've never backed a Kickstarter before, uh, never backed a mm-hmm. Kickstarter campaign uh, to start with Kickstarter because it's the most well known brand. And this comes to, to like the next thing, which I think sort of answers all of this, where the most sought after commodity nowadays is not, you know, replayability, price, deluxification, all of that is, is nice. But I think that the make or break for every single campaign is trust. Can I trust these people to a actually deliver the game yeah and deliver on their promise that that promise that they they promised me this experience will the game actually feel this way and in in this day and age we're all the time skeptical i hope i hope most people are are skeptical whenever they see an a post or a news article or something which looks fishy or you know anything like that so and, and kickstarter is basically in a way, a petri dish of of things you shouldn't trust. Okay, you mentioned a few of those just now. It's like, oh, it's some someone that just whipped something on Blender and put it. And especially in the board game community, we've grown very sensitive to those red flags. Every time, you know, hardcore super backers will go and they'll see the history of yeah. of that company. Have yeah. they delivered their previous ones? What do the comments look like? Everything is transparent on a Kickstarter campaign or a game founder backer kit. You can see everything. And we are thirsty for companies and brands that we can trust and we can feel like they are taking me on a journey and I don't need to double check them. I think a good example would be, have you had that experience where, I I find that a lot with books actually. Sometimes I'm reading a book and I'm waiting for the book to impress me. I'm waiting for, I can feel the writer still writing out the words. I'm like, okay, what is it? Where is he going with this? What are we even doing here? You know, tell me your story. Is the book going to win me by the end? And some books, which are very special, you bet you get completely sucked into. And you're basically at the whim of the storyteller. 
You're like, I'm going to trust you. I don't care where you take me. Just take me on this journey. Just tell me more. And, you know, I, I'm now reading a lot of Brandon Sanderson, and I really feel like he's one of those uh, authors loves, which I can fully trust. Brandon Sanderson. Everybody. Fully trust. He will deliver. <clears throat> everything is going to have a payoff. You, you're going to have a satisfying ending. And it's it's such a relief, in a way, to let go, to go on this journey. I think I think Brandon Sanderson's at the, the 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 point where he could say, right, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna write a book, <clears throat> I'm gonna put it on Kickstarter, and for every dollar you pledge, I'm gonna write a word. Because I think he's at that point now where he was he's got he's, is he not now responsible for like two of two of the most successful two Kickstarter of most, campaigns most successful of all Kickstarter time. And let me ask, you, why do you think that is? Uh, because uh, he knows well, no, because he's built up a he's built up an audience, and he's got the super fans that are like you know, and he's already delivered on one kind of game. So there's the trust thing there, but there's also the super kind of the super fan side of things as well. For me, it's Pratchett. Pratchett's always the one that's always taken me on a kind of a journey to the point where it's like you quote kind of certain points of the book. Or in some ways, it's a book that just doesn't is takes your mindset and takes it into a different, a particular place. You know, everybody everybody knows about the the kind of the Sam Vimes theory of kind of economy according to boot according to boots and buying kind of boots for work. Everybody knows that. You know, it's like one of these things that you know his work has all his work has always kind of been exceptional exemplary and he's always been such an ally for everybody kind of that was around him as well it was a sad thing that he passed away and how he passed away but you kind of you've got your cat you've got your little box of terry pratchett books and you can say this is a this is a box of pure wonder and magic and loveliness and just you know life affirming kind of choices and stuff like that and there's nothing to sully it there's nothing that's seeping in the side that's saying but actually you know what I mean? He didn't like, you know, he, di- he didn't like small puppies that were kind of like <laughs> yellow in colour or whatever. Or he was a big chicken fan. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I know that that'll make you happy because you're obviously quite a, big, quite a big chicken so, fan. So we're still going on about this until until the end of the day. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I'm, I mean, you, funny you should mention Terry Pratchett. Oh. <laughs> why, why is that, Ori? Well... <laughs> Let me just say, stay tuned this week. Right. Stay tuned this week. Right. I might have a nice little video, which we've been working on, that you might enjoy. And, unless, of course, it takes me ages to edit this, and then it's stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. Uh, I might just like, release it in two weeks' time, just no. so that we stay tuned next week, and everybody's so, like, God, he already did it. Yep. If, if if this is two weeks in the future, no, 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 it's not. It's not at all. It's not at all. Let's keep them in kind of suspense and excited. You know, I'll get this edited. I'm probably not going to edit it. You know, let's just let's just let's just put two slices of bread around it, and you know. I hope you give me your seal of approval after you see what we're. Well, I'll, you know, I will be very, 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 very non-complimentary. You know, as <laughs> as is, is there. Moving this on, because look at this, we've already been talking for an hour and I'm having oh my a... goodness. Exactly, this is I'm the fun factory. Is there a campaign, looking back on kind of like crowdfunding in general and stuff like that, is there a campaign that you would have loved to have done the video for? Mm. That you look and go, I would, if I'd done, not, not, that the, not that the video that was done for it was bad, but you had an idea and you went, ah, oh, they just, if they just, you know, did put more chickens in it. <laughs> and and then, you know, this isn't going away. Uh, Quack. Don't do that. Well, <laughs> I, there is a campaign, but there's a stipulation because I think the video, and I know who did the video. It's okay. uh, Hexy Studios. Okay. They did Are the you video. Hexy Studios. Exit it's Studios, called, yeah. the animator is called Tomash. He's a okay. wonderful person, very there talented. And they did the video for the Heroes 3 campaign. <sighs> okay. 
and they did they, they which is now basically running for the expansion and they did also yeah, yeah, the follow up yeah, yeah, video yeah 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 heroes 3 i have it literally like on my desktop right now <laughs> is is one of those connections i have to my childhoods which is just i would get lost in that game for hours and hours and hours and when I saw that they announced it, I actually emailed them. I'm like, hey, do you need a video or something like that? Which never works. You never, you need, you need someone to recommend you. But part of me sort of wished I, I would have pushed a bit more because honestly, and I'm waiting for that for my game to arrive. I, I, I ordered the base game. I would have loved to create that video, but I think Tomas did a fantastic job. He did the original music, the original sound effects. It was, it was stellar. I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there? I mean, you have worked with quite a big, a few, a few kind of recognisable names. Is there a company out there? Okay, let's open this up wide. Let's let's not talk about board game companies. Let's talk about you know you've been given the uh, Willy Wonka golden ticket, and it's a case that if you go into the door walk through the door and present the ticket and you mention a company, you will be able to produce um, a piece of work for them. Who is it that, who is it that you're gonna be who is it you're gonna be creating work for? And you're not allowed to stay Star Wars. You're catching me in a weird look. I did do a Star Wars video, but it wasn't my production. I go. helped out with one of my fellow animators, mm. George uh, George Georgius, who has another studio, Nero. All the animators are good friends. We're, we're good friends. We hang out in conventions and stuff like that. We chat all the time. So he he had the opportunity to do the pandemic version of the Clone Wars. And right. he's like, Ori, I'm going to bring you on board because I know how much you like Star Wars. And wow. that was, I mean, I'm literally painting the miniatures right now. All that paint you've seen. That's on pretty my, good. Yeah, That's pretty you. good. Darth Maul was really I can't, hard to do. It's no, he's just he's got red head. Oh, of course he's got his little spike things. Yeah. yeah see, I just, uh, see, yeah, I would so just good. end up making a mess of that. There we so, go. Here's uh, another one. This is really good podcasting stuff. Oh, he's yes. Got, <laughs> or he's at, can you hear the paint to the brushes? He's showing um, us his collection of paintings that he's done. One of them was uh, Ahsoka. Yeah. And the other and, one was Darth Maul. And they look, they look, they look wonderful. Thank you. It's like my, like my second paint job. I just got into this. I'm so addicted. But basically, so this, yeah. after I did that, which was like, oh, I did Star Wars. And I've done all these, like, and I've done Dune. You know, I did, did all the greatest hits. I've done Terminator, Rome Total War, Skyrim, most recently Firefly, the something which I can't talk about yet. And, it, and there's more. There's more coming. It's like endless. And it was always a fear that once I get to those high level IPs, I will have less creativity. I definitely yeah. felt that with Star Wars. With Star Wars, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't show a lightsaber at night. We could only show like physical cards, physical yeah. miniatures, don't play yeah. around with it. Yeah. And that's the only way to approve it. So in a way, wishing to work for a bigger company does, does have a price because that yeah. means you have less creativity. You're more... Jeez, I don't want to jinx it. I'm meeting with a huge company this week. A huge, uh, the biggest company, you could even say, when it comes to the board game industry. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I'm already working with Asmodee with a few of their companies. They're just fantastic somehow, you know, in such a huge company. They're just so many creative people and just amazing human beings, which allow us to have an actual discussion and actual creativity. But there's always that fear of that that TV studio with the people with the black circles under their eyes and the coffee cups, there was that fear of going too big, too corporate. Yeah. And I have a huge love for first time creators. I have at least half of my clients are first time creators and it's such a joy to work with them because the creativity is limitless and you get to help seeing someone achieve their dream. Yeah. And I've, I've had people break into tears when they watch the video for the first time and they watch it like 50 times. And it's, it's, I, I, there isn't a greater feeling than that. It's, um, it's so good to hear you being so modest <laughs> <laughs> about your work. It's like, that's the quote, isn't it? That's the quote for the top of the website. I will make you cry. 
<laughs> my videos, my videos are so good. I've made I've made grown adults cry over the toys that they are trying to sell. I'm... Other, other, but you've got to have that kind of attitude at some point because the problem and the thing is right with everybody kind of pitching and they will you know normally get other people pitching. There will be somebody that's coming in and going right. Okay, you can stop now because you found me. You're welcome. You know, you're well, no, it's good. No, no, don't stand up. No, no, don't get security again, <laughs> please. You know, I'm here. Microsoft Paint is my jam. I know exactly what I'm doing. We're doing flick books and claymation. That's how we're doing this. You know, no ducks. Chickens, chickens. No chickens. So there is potentially the person that you want to work with is kind of floating about. Do I want to work with them? I don't know. I don't know. I want to uh, look. I'm so lucky to work in this industry. I, yeah. I honestly, it's it's like I have super fans everywhere. You know, we're talking about the super fans. I work with people that I would love to work with all the time. Saying no, you know, I, I, I had a hard time saying no in the beginning. I have no choice to say no to most of my leads now because we just don't have time. And I, I know I cannot <laughs> give it my 100%. And it's painful because each time I say no, it's like a there's a split in the timeline of, you know, me spending a month or so or a few months with this amazing creative and creating something amazing together mm. or working with someone else. And that's also why I, I started now the, the Kagan Academy, which is basically just working on the strategy part, no video, just strategy, just figuring out how to mm. sell your game and doing it in a group setting. So we're like, we already started uh, last week. We have five uh, community members. It's been amazing seeing them sort of grow together, get to know each other, talk about their games and, uh, you know, being part of that process uh, of figuring out from the time you finished working on the game itself. And then you need to figure out how to market the game and launch a Kickstarter. And that's what I want to help with. So hopefully that will satisfy that part of myself. So I can do my own Star Wars video. <laughs> is you mentioned that you're one of the things you're looking at doing is the kind of the brand the brand building to get your name kind of out there as a as an individual is it difficult when you're used to presenting a showreel and saying hey look how good i am with blender and this claymation and this flip book to actually going out and saying, well, this is who I am as a person. Because to me, the Duck Academy stuff sounds like it's more you front-facing as opposed to being, I'm letting my videos kind of do the work. Mm -hmm. So is that not, is that, because it sounds to me your career has always been, I'm the guy that you see kind of like with the dial wheel and the mouse kind of like, going back through the frames and stuff like that and pressing the buttons and stuff to actually appearing in front of people. So is, it, is, it, is that part of the, the kind of the whole thing? Let's kind of present, put a face on it. A hundred percent. It's, I'm a very introverted person. It's, it's sometimes hard to see because I'm every time at a, I'm at a convention or like a gathering or playing board games or mm. on a podcast right now, I'm forcing myself to be extroverted and to be comfortable talking about myself and about my life. And I, I mm. almost never talk about that stuff. I always, when I'm in conversations, it's like podcasts, it's the rare times where I allow myself to talk about myself rather than turning it around and asking questions about the other person because I don't feel comfortable about talking about myself. And that was a very long process for me to, to realize that people, that the video isn't speaking for itself. I didn't used to do sales calls. I was terrified of sales calls. I used to do only, you know, only via email, only chat via email. I'll give a quote, you know, I'll, I'll explain, I'll, I'll show examples. Yeah. And I realized that, you know, it was a difficult learning experience. I realized that I have to have sales calls because it goes back to that thing. Trust. If someone is going to now pay me thousands of dollars, and hopefully, you know, get a video that actually helps them because there, it, it needs to do something. Yeah. It's a lot of risk. And if you don't have that connection, if you don't have that trust, that, that sort of camaraderie right from the start, it's going to be very hard for someone to commit. 
and it started out as a necessity. I, I realized I had to do it. Yeah. It was terrifying. And I, I, you know, after a sales call, I used to just go lie down. I was just like, oh, it was too much. It was so much energy for me. And it's like a muscle. Eventually I got to working and got better in it. And, and it was sometime I just realized I don't have to be that person I think I need to be. And it's cliche, but I just need to be myself. I can geek out. These are my people. There is, isn't some like, you know, high tech company or something like these are my people. You know, we can look at each other's background and geek out on the board games behind them. And there's nothing to be scared of. Oh, I'm sure you have them somewhere. No, no. Board games. Board games are for nerds. The sales thing's interesting though, because I do that a lot. I do a lot of sales. I, I, I'm like, I do a lot of consultancy stuff. But I think what's happening nowadays is that there's a lot of depersonalization corporate level. So if you're looking for support and help and information and stuff like that, that it all seems to be, there seems to be this big drive to kind of like uh, what they call artificial intelligence. There doesn't seem to be any, any kind of artificial intelligence kind of, there's no intelligence there. It just seems to be kind of like it's machine learning, but it's not really learning. You know, I try to explain to my, I try to explain to my, my son today, my youngest about kind of AI. And I says, it's like, it's like if I go and search and use an AI tool to tell me what a bicycle is, it'll come back and it'll quote exactly what a bicycle is. But it won't understand that a bicycle is a contraption that is, con that is you know, steered by human being, that it requires kind of human power for it to be kind of by steered and stuff like that. So, and with obviously with your kind of industry, are you, I mean, there's obviously, a, there's going to be people that are going to go, well, I can do Kickstarter videos through AI in five minutes. And I know it's like, you know, it's, it was, what is it? Gomero del Toro, who this week said they're going to make they're going to make some amazing interactive screensavers with AI, but that's about as far as it that's about as far as it goes. Kind of thing. Out of all my peers, I feel like I'm the most optimistic about our future with <clears throat> the, the whole AI thing happening, and a lot of people think that I'm crazy. I don't know. I mean, I've been following it very, very closely. Everything image, video, voiceover. And it just, it's, it never can never cross the uncanny valley. It gets very close. It just never manages to capture the imagination of intention. And that's, that's a thing that I think that AI will never manage to replace. If you don't have the intention behind it, if you don't have the artist trying to to do something with it it will feel dry it will feel soulless yeah that being said i do think there are some wonderful tools people should know about and utilize because then they'll definitely be left behind um, yeah no no absolutely i mean i mean i use i use the editing software i use is called the script is based around kind of they say it's ai but it's 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 cleverish but the funniest thing about it is when I kind of edit a podcast and I've started using it to edit the podcast, it will import all of the conversation and it'll change it into text. <clears throat> and rather than me editing a wavelength, if I want to, you know, if I want to edit anything at all, then all I'll do is I'll just highlight the text and I'll press delete and it'll, it'll delete the actual sound wave off the conversation. So it makes it kind of interesting. Where it doesn't work is it also has this AI speaking functionality where what I can do is it can use my voice to then try and then if I put in like a review I've written, I can put this into this AI thing and it'll spit out an approximation of what it sounds like, you know, me actually talking through the piece. The issue with it is it's a... <laughs> It's American. It's, it comes out with some kind of pseudo American Canadian kind of accent, where it kind of semi sounds like me, but it doesn't. As you say, it doesn't cross the uncanny, va uncanny valley. One of my friends says, if you ever want to know what actually dreaming when you're awake looks like, go and watch any of the AI kind of videos out there, 
and it's like the kind of the same uncanny valley you get is the same kind of uncanny value. My dreams are more interesting than that. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see what's happening. I'm aware I've taken up an awful lot of your time. I'm aware it's getting late. I'm aware you've got much more important things to do than speak to this. Nah. Sportsman. If people have listened along tonight or today or tomorrow or next week when it gets surprisingly and interesting and they want to find about more about your bad self, where do you exist on the internet webs? Well, if you just want to see like our videos and our know who, what we're about, then just go to the website, kickingproductions.com. Also, King and Productions on YouTube, if you just want to see all of our videos. Yeah. And another thing which I want to promote is my Instagram channel, King and Productions again, but there I'm posting a lot of marketing advice. This is something that I've, I've took upon myself to try to bridge that gap. A lot of people hate marketing, especially in the, in the creative side. I mean, I used to hate it. And I'm trying to make it a bit easier for people. So I'm uploading a lot of fun content there. Cool. Good stuff. Good stuff. What we'll do is we will, of course, put all of the links in the show notes so that we've got show notes to show. If you're interested in finding out what we're doing, then if you go to we'renotwizards.co.uk, it will take you to all the reviews that we've written, where we've taken words and we've written them down with sometimes okay opinions that you can read and then go he doesn't know what he's talking about or if you go to we are not wizards.com it'll now forward on to our spotify page because we're now being hosted by spotify which has been quite nice i mean it's not you know it's well you know it's fine and you can you can download it you can stream it you can comment on it if you're using the spotify app uh, sometimes we'll put on a little poll on episodes so if you're listening through a spotify app you can answer the poll if you want but we're in all the other places instagram and facebook and i don't know stone guard and <laughs> up lop and pipaloppy and uh, chickenberry is the new chickenberry that's the new social <laughs> media quack channel. That's available. Don't say that. Uh, um, and if you like what you've listened to, please like tell other people because that's how we spread like some kind of horrific, world-ending virus. There's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Ori? Don't. Maybe. Oh, for <laughs> goodness! Right. Okay. Thanks. And the second. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's it's goodbye. It's goodbye from the man himself. If he was if he was in space, the only one Kagani. Or Ron Kenobi. Yeah. He's the, what he's offering isn't chicken feed. No. Nope. He's like the man that walks into the library and asks for a book. Um, don't leave him scratching around. I'm not He's a rooster around. of the video market. It's the man from Gigan <laughs> for chickens. Shins. Sorry. <clears throat> Say goodbye, Ori. <laughs> goodbye, goodbye, Ori. <laughs> it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Make something awful. And as Luke says, stay spicy. But until the next time, goodbye. <laughs> For real. <laughs> mm.